Hey everyone, I'm Brandy. And I'm Adam. I'm sorry, what are you wearing? I am currently on vacation. As people are watching this right now, <laughs> I am on a beach enjoying the sun while yelling at my kids to stop throwing sand at each other. I you mean, know, I love the beach, but I hate the sand. It's a oh, weird I get dynamic. It. Yeah, I get it. I but get anyways. It. I see is, what you did there. This is why I'm wearing I this. See. It's a lovely shirt. You can only wear this in two places, on a cruise or at the beach. Or during this. Exactly. So, good stuff. Anyhow, welcome to the Ridge. It's so good to see all of you. We are wrapping up our series called The Art of Neighboring today, and Pastor Josh Rhodes is going to continue laying out the biblical case for being great neighbors who make a difference where God has placed us. We have an awesome set that's ready to go for worship, and it's gonna be a good one. We are so glad that you are here. But before we get started, Adam and I are here to tell you about what is happening around the Ridge. That's right. Hey, we can't wait for the next Baptism Sunday on September 4th. We believe that baptism is a public celebration of moving from death to life through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and Baptism Sunday is a way for our church to come together and celebrate those who have taken that step. So if you're interested in being baptized, we encourage you to attend an informational meeting that's today, right after the 11 a.m. service in the hub. Yes. There's gonna be free pizza. Yes. I mean, that's a plus. Not like you needed another reason to go. No, of course not. But it's it's just a nice little incentive. Yeah. Hey, but if you can't make it, that's okay. And it, if you would like more information, just go to the ridge.church slash baptism to get that information and to register, but we can't wait for Baptism Sunday. Absolutely, and if you don't know, the hub is towards the tile. If it's you're in the towards building, the tile. towards the tile. <laughs> Head towards the tile. Heads towards the, yes. Yeah. Fall is just around the corner, which is crazy. You're sure you're gonna have to huh, figure something have to else figure out. Something. That's okay. And it'll be like a, a maroon. <laughs> with like maple leaves. Yes. That's beautiful. gonna be great. Anyhow. <laughs> I hope I can find a maroon and maple leaf shirt. Man, that would I be I really amazing. hope so too. Anyways, groups are coming. <laughs> Fall means that we're ready to kick off our groups in September. Yes. And we want everyone in the church to be connected because groups are a great way for us to grow with God and others. That's right. Our care groups are gonna kick off the week of September 7th and we have three different ones happening this fall. Divorce Care, which is a safe place where we can come alongside you and help you find healing from the pain of separation or divorce. We've got Grief Share, which is a caring group of people who will walk alongside you through life's most difficult experience. And Financial Peace, which is a course that teaches you how to save for emergencies, pay off debt fast, spend wisely, and invest in your future. And you can learn more about each of these groups and sign up by going to the ridge.church slash events. Yeah, I just love that we have these yeah. offered to be able to kind of come alongside each other and going through those tough times in life. And the Financial Peace, my wife and I did that yeah. early on in our marriage and it was huge for us. So we encourage you to check that out. Yeah. Hey, if you're new with us today, thank you so much for joining us, checking us out. We would love to get to know you and uh, just hear about your experience today. So head to the ridge.church slash new. For those of you in the room, you can head to Next Steps right here in the lobby. We have some amazing people that would love to meet you and just answer any questions that you may have. Well, you know, today we are wrapping up the Art of Neighboring, which right. means that we're gonna have five more minutes with Josh. Ooh. Yeah, we usually do those with Tim, but it's gonna be me since you're on vacation. That's right. And I, Josh. Yeah. So you get to hear a recap and some additional insights that he has. So you're gonna to wanna to check it out. It's gonna release Friday the 19th. That's this the, Friday, yes, right? Yes, yeah. this Friday. This Friday the 19th on the Ridge Weekly Podcast, so you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. It's crazy, it was nine weeks since the last five more minutes. And now we're like, And now it's like two go. weeks and we've got back to back, <laughs> That's it's great. Right. Hey, uh, so that also means that next week we're starting a new series called Immovable. Pastor Tim will be back to give us this great series on the reliability of the Bible. So we hope that you can join us for that. I'm really excited for that one. This is another, it's gonna be great. Yeah, yeah. It's another two week series. And then we've got <laughs> Baptism Sunday, September 4th. So. Man, it's gonna be happening fast, Absolutely. fall, all all the things are happening. Craziness. <laughs> well, for everything that's happening around the Ridge, make sure you follow us on Facebook or Instagram or subscribe to our weekly email. That's it for us. We hope you have a great service. I'm at the beach. <laughs>
God, we give you our worship. We give you our worship and we give you our praise. God, our eyes have seen you do the miraculous. God, our eyes have seen how you have, have taken care of us, God. Our eyes have seen in the moments when we didn't think it was possible or there, there wasn't a way that you made a way. God, today we give you our, our worship. We give you our praise. God, however we're coming into this service, whether we're on a mountaintop and things are going well or whether we're struggling and, and hanging on by a thread, God, remind us that there is hope because of Jesus Christ who came into this world to save us. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us, whether you're here in person or you're here with us online. Feel free to grab a seat. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, if we haven't connected before, and so glad that you're with us. I know it's move-in weekend here at West Virginia University, so if you're a student in person or, or joining or family, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, next week, our, our lead pastor, Tim Herring, will be back start starting a brand new series just about how we can trust the Bible, so you won't want to miss next week. Uh, but today, we're going to be wrapping up a series that we've called The Art of Neighboring. It seems to me that a number of my favorite TV shows, which I was born early 80s, so most of them are from the 90s, include a strong character, uh, a strong neighbor character, who is either just very thoughtful or funny or at times just over the top. So I thought we'd have a little bit of fun today, and I'm going to share three catchphrases and see if you can figure out which neighbor character this is in the show that they're from, and no Googling, all right? Deals? Phones down, phones away. All right, first one is Heidi Ho, neighbor. All right, Heidi Ho, neighbor. Anybody? Anybody? That was Wilson, all right? Tim Allen's neighbor. That's him peering over the fence. He always had that bucket hat. He was, he was the older, wiser neighbor who was always there to, to give Tim some advice. And you just wish that he would pop over the fence, but he never did. You never saw his face, and it just drove you crazy. All right, the second one actually got a, a recent reboot on Netflix, so this is kind of popular again, I guess. But in the original, the neighbor would burst into the door, and most of the time she would say, Hola, Tanuritos. All right, there's a clue in there. All right, hola, Tanner Ritos. All right, that was Kimmy Gibbler from Full House, and she's right in the middle of the, the family there. And the third one, which I think you're going to get right away, this was one of my favorite shows, and in the original, he wasn't even included. It was, I think, an afterthought. They wrote him in early on. But his tagline was... Did I do that? Steve Urkel. How close was I? I've been practicing. Not, not far off, so Steve Urkel, absolutely. He was always just barging in, breaking stuff, driving Mr. Winslow crazy. But one of the things that I appreciate about these shows and many other shows in our culture, whether it's Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, even Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, all right? These shows communicate the importance of neighbors. Uh, they, they, importance the, they, they communicate the importance of knowing our neighbors and having them be a part of our life, even if they drive us crazy like Steve Urkel. And it's not just shows and movies, it's, it's in business. There's companies like State Farm who have built their brand on, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there, right? So why does this matter? I mean, this has been something that people have been really good at uh, for a long time, but maybe we've lost it a little bit. But wh why does it matter? What is the practical difference it can make? Well, a few weeks ago, a woman named, named Erica Pandy wrote an article called The Power of Knowing Your Neighbors. And she said when that happens, when people are connected with their neighbors, some amazing things happen. First is boosted well-being. People who know their neighbors are generally cheerier, healthier, and spend more time outside. They have happier aging. Older adults who know their neighbors report a far higher sense of psychological well-being. Safer streets. Tight-knit neighborhoods have lower rates of gun violence. 
and lives saved. Literal lives saved. In well-connected neighborhoods, it's reported that the fewer lives are lost in tragedies, including natural disasters and shootings. So you look at a list like that, it's incredible. And it shows how high the stakes are, and, and so many of you are already doing this, and you're already connected, and you know firsthand the difference it can make. But in this article, Erica points out that unfortunately a lot of Americans no longer know their neighbors, and if they do, they don't even talk with them. She says that 57% of Americans say they only know some or none of their neighbors. That share climbs to 72% among 30 to 49-year-olds and 78% among 18 to 29-year-olds. 58% 58 say they know their neighbors, but they don't spend time chatting or hanging out with them. And as a result, most of the people living around us are strangers. So if this is true, that most people, whether it be Christian or non-Christian alike, have lost or have never discovered the art of neighboring, is it any wonder why perhaps so many people, maybe you, are feeling isolated, disconnected, hopeless, helpless, need real help, but have no one to call on? So last week we kicked off uh, this two-week series called Art of Neighboring. It's based on uh, this, this book right here. My author and pastors, uh, Dave Pathak and Dave Runyon, or Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon, great little book. And they based the book on Jesus' great commandment and their own experience, kind of going from not neighboring at all to really discovering this art of neighboring. So they based it off of Jesus' great commandment. We see it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And last week we looked at the commandment from Luke in the context of the parable of the Good Samaritan. If you missed last week, feel free to go back and catch up. Let's look at the great commandment from the Gospel of Matthew. It says, when the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So what we talked about last week was how Jesus' great commandment of loving God and loving our neighbors, which are the ones who are far but they're also the ones who are near. They go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin because if we are growing in our relationship with God, as this great commandment says, with all of ourselves, all of our mind and all of our soul and strength, our whole being, to love the one who loves us, to love the one who created us, to love the one who died for us. If we are doing that, then the natural byproduct, the overflow, is that we will love what he loves and who he loves. That's what will happen. And our neighbor is the person across the globe. And our neighbor is the person across the country and across the state, city. And it means then that our neighbor is the one across the street who we tend to leave out. The main truth that we discussed last week then is that loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself includes your actual neighbors. This is like Christianity 101 that we've got to get back to. And if we believe that God is sovereign, if we believe that he has placed us where we are, whether that be for a short season or even forever, then that means that we are uniquely qualified to know, serve, and love our own neighbors. I said last week, I can't fully neighbor your neighbors, and you can't fully neighbor mine because I'm my neighbor's neighbor and you're your neighbor's neighbor. And while we are called to love everyone, we have far more opportunities, far more practical, tangible, daily opportunities to love the people who are closest to us. And really good things happen with really good neighbors, they just do. So it begs the question, why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? 
I mean, this is kind of woven throughout culture. This is something that is so clearly taught by Jesus. Why is it that for years, in the several places that I lived, I didn't know my neighbor's names? Why is it that for years, most of the time I would come home, turn off the car, and head inside without having a conversation? And, and why, for many years, was I not quick to open my home and invite a neighbor in? Well, in my experience, and, and I would say the experience of others, as we look to apply Jesus' great commandment seriously, we will face some obstacles. We're going to, right? This, is a path of least res this isn't a path of least resistance. There is going to be some resistance. And we're also probably going to make some excuses. I know I have. But we can't let those stop us because the stakes are way too high. So whether you live in a dorm, townhouse, subdivision, or out in the country, all of us have neighbors. We do. Whether we know them or not, all of us have neighbors, and we have an opportunity to show them the love of Christ, to give them practical help, because Scripture says we are the body of Christ, we are the hands and feet of Jesus, and they need us, and we need their friendship, we need their love, we need their support in return. So based on their book, my experiences and others, I want to talk about five obstacles I think we face Five obstacles that we're going to face in loving our neighbors. You probably have already faced them. And my hope today is, as we give a biblical response for each, that it will help us overcome. That it will help us overcome these obstacles so that we can love our neighbors well. And our takeaway today is this. Ask God to help you. Ask God to help you overcome any obstacle that is keeping you from loving your actual neighbors. And here's why I, I say this, because if God commanded us to do this, and if he said this is of utmost importance, then we can have confidence that he will help us, even if that obstacle seems insurmountable, even if it seems like something that we cannot do or we're not equipped to do or qualified to do, I believe if we ask God for help, he will help us. So the first obstacle I want to talk about, this is probably going to be the most obvious, is the obstacle of time. Because most of us are already too busy. Our lives are marked by time. Years, months, days, hours, minutes. You can work hard to make more money, but you can't make more time. It truly is our most precious commodity. And we don't know how much more of it we have. We want to believe we have many more years, but we simply do not know. James reminds us of this. It says, you don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like smoke that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Time goes quickly. We don't know how much more of it we have. So we've got to invest it wisely, which includes investing in loving our neighbors. I don't know about your phone, but about once a week, I get this really pesky notification. It's called weekly screen time report. Do you guys get that? Does it drive you nuts like it drives me nuts? It shows me that I am wasting precious time. I'm investing way too much time in funny YouTube videos. There is no return on that investment. Whereas when we invest time wisely, when we set it a time for our relationship with God, with family, with neighbors, we can have a tremendous return on investment. But it is going to require that we remove some things, that we reprioritize some things, that we slow down and we stop using the phrase, I'm just so busy, as some kind of badge of honor. In chapter 3 of Dave and Jay's book, it's, it's titled, The... Um, the time factor, they wrote this about Jesus, and, and just think about all of the demands that Jesus had on him, that he was God in flesh, all that he could have done for each and every person, everybody who was pulling on him. They write this, and I think it's so true. It says, the healthiest person who ever lived was Jesus. He got a lot done, but when we read about his life, the word hurried never comes to mind. Jesus came to offer us a different way of living. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, John 10.10. 10. 
He wasn't talking about full in the sense of having a packed schedule. He meant it in the sense of abundance. In other words, a good, meaningful life. Are you living life to the full, or do you just have a full schedule? There's a big difference. The world will try to convince us that being busy and being occupied every night of the week, every single weekend, is good for us. I don't think it is. And how does a busy, distracted, or isolated life impact our ability to love our neighbors well? They just don't line up well. Like anything else, art of neighboring is going to take time. It just is. And while it's still nice out, this might not mean some crazy overhaul. It might just mean thinking differently about our time. Maybe you spend a lot of time on your back deck. What if you just shifted spending that time to your front porch? Or if you're already going to be walking your dog, could you walk your dog with a little more intentionality and be willing to stop and greet someone along the way? Or be like Regina, who's a part of our church. And any time she goes to the store, she just tries to think of one person she can text to see if they need something. Or she'll pick up a bouquet of flowers and drop it back off because she's already going to the store. You can just tack it on. Or like my neighbor Brenton, who has a home, a workout facility in his garage. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you would like pay to go to. And every day around 5 o'clock, he opens his garage and invites others in. He's already going to be working out, so why not just invite people to come in and participate with you? It, it may not mean that we flip our life upside down, but if we can just think differently about how we're spending our time and where we're spending our time, we probably will have more for our neighbors. The second obstacle is the, the, is the total number that we have. For some of you, whether you live in the dorm or apartment building or a similar setting, the total number of nearby neighbors for you might be huge. I mean, you may have 50, 100, or more. The others of you probably live in a rural country setting. I mean, where, where we live, that's probably a lot of you, and you may not have very many neighbors to even neighbor. To those of you with a lot of neighbors, which I would be in that category, our street, we have about 50, I want to remind you of Jesus' ministry. Jesus regularly drew large crowds, and he would teach them, and, and he would feed them, and, and seek to care for them. But of those large crowds, Luke 10 says that there, was, there were 70 disciples who he was pouring into and that he sent out. But then within that number... There was 12 that he chose to invest in more deeply. And by focusing his efforts and pouring more deeply into those 12 for those three years, after his resurrection, he was able to, to confidently commission them to go into the world to share the gospel. Very familiar passage, the Great Commission, Matthew 28. It says, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. It says 11, of course, because Judas had taken his life. So there was 11 disciples who he commissioned to take the good news into the world. And we know they were successful because we're here in 2022 talking about Jesus. And I think this is a, example is, is very important for us with a lot of neighbors because if we try to love everyone equally, if I try to know and serve and love and really be a part of every person on my street, all 50-some, as much as I wish I could do that, I probably will be spread too thin. I probably would be spread too thin and not end up really loving any of them very well. This is why I love the tic-tac-toe board that we introduced last week. This is kind of a key theme in the art of neighboring. In this picture, it just shows uh, nine homes and it has us imagine that we're in the center and the eight other homes represent our eight nearest neighbors, whether that's apartments, townhomes, or farms, you know, a few miles away. And the challenge is just for us to start learning and using our neighbors' names. 
Because as we mentioned last week, to love someone well, it helps to know their name. And you can get this on the website or you can get it in the lobby if you're here in person. But as I think about this, I figure if Jesus invested in 12, it seems right that I aim for 8, 9, maybe 10 and really do that well. And I love what Dave and Jay point out, that we should be friendly with everyone, right? As I drive down my street, I'm not going to ignore everyone until I get to my bottom 10. I'm going to be friendly and I'm going to wave and I'm going to smile but they challenge us to be friendly with everyone and close with a few. Now, on the other side of things, if you have a few neighbors, I want to remind you what Jesus did. Of those 12, he invested even more deeply in three, Peter, James, and John. There were times where he would pull aside and give more attention and more investment into those three. And the story that we looked at last week, the Good Samaritan, that man came to the aid of one person. One person. And I think a lot of times we think we have to help everyone, but an art of neighboring bigger isn't better. It's simply loving well the people who are nearest you, even if you have to drive a mile to get to them. I heard a great story this week about a guy named Ken who's a part of our church, and his garden that he put in did extraordinarily well this year. And they've got three kids, and they can't possibly consume all of it. So he loaded up, I think it was just a giant, like, garbage can. I'm assuming it was clean, you know, just a great big bin. And he loaded it up, threw it on the back of his tractor, and just spent a few hours driving a half mile to this neighbor, and then a half mile to this neighbor, and then a mile to this neighbor, just driving his tractor like a, like a produce ice cream truck, you know? A lot of the folks he had never met, but went and knocked on the door and said, hey, could you use some of this? And they came out, they were able to choose some things and begin to connect. You know, we may not have a lot of neighbors, but you can impact the ones that you have. The third obstacle, the third obstacle, and I have faced this and this is a real one, and it can be really discouraging, but maybe you've carved out time, and maybe you are like Ken, and you loaded up the produce to go offer it, but they just don't seem to be interested. So maybe you would say, you know what, I tried. I tried, and it just didn't work out. What do you do in that situation where you, you went to introduce yourself, or you went to connect, or you extend the invitation, and it just didn't work? Do we write those people off? Do we try harder? What do we do with that? I would encourage us just be faithful. That's God's call on our life. We can't produce the fruit, but we can be faithful. Keep smiling, keep waving, keep being courteous. Because we don't know what's going on the other side of that door. Perhaps that individual has health concerns that they, they don't want to talk about. So it may be that it can't even really be close to people and they don't really want to share that information. Or maybe they are working overtime to make ends meet and they don't have much time to come out and hang because they're so exhausted. Or, or maybe they had some bad experiences with neighbors and they're still trying to feel you out. When we read the great commandment, it doesn't say love your neighbor as yourself if they love you back. It doesn't say only love your neighbor as yourself if they reciprocate the eggs or the produce or the lending hand. It just says love your neighbor as yourself. Keep at it. I love what Galatians chapter 9 says. I hang on to these verses in so many aspects of my life, whether it's neighboring or my parenting, whatever it might be. It says this, so we must not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, we must work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Because here's the thing. Most of us are already tired. We've talked about being too busy. We want to just throw in the towel if it's not easy or if they don't reciprocate. But keep at it. Keep praying. Keep serving. Keep giving. Give it time. And maybe... That neighbor will eventually open up. Maybe they will reciprocate. Maybe they will be willing to have that relationship with you. Maybe they don't. 
Maybe for whatever reason, they never open up, and that's okay. We can't make anyone be our friend. We can't make anybody come to faith in Christ, but we can be faithful. We can continue to love regardless of how they respond. So our time, our total numbers of neighbors, we've tried. This fourth one, I think, applies to so many of us, and it's that we're timid. We're just not sure how this is going to go. And maybe for you, the thought of putting yourself out there, to be intentional, to get to know someone, and you would say, Josh, I, I like people, and I know Jesus said I'm supposed to, but I'm just not outgoing. I'm just not a people person. Or maybe you did try, or maybe you got burnt, and you're a little more guarded, and you're not sure how it's going to go with that individual, or quite frankly, there might be someone that's rude, or there might be someone that you're just a little bit unsure about or has a bad reputation or, or whatever the case might be. I appreciate what Dave and Jay say in their chapter called Fear Factor. This is just really good wisdom. It says, we're not recommending that you simply dismiss all of your fears and blindly jump into every one of your neighbor's lives. After all, at times our fears are valid and can save us from dangerous and unhealthy situations. On the other hand, our fears are often unwarranted and may be obstacles to obeying the Great Commission. So if we're going to neighbor well, we must have courage to wrestle with our fears. We must have courage. We talked last week about how when you don't know someone's name, they're a stranger. But once you meet them and connect with them, that stranger suddenly turns into a real person. So how do we overcome our fears? Man, with Scripture, with what God's Word says is true. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness. That's not how God wants us to operate. God doesn't want us walking around on eggshells, worried how things are going to go. That's not who our God is. What does He want for us? Walking around in fear, walking around in timidity? No. No. He wants us to walk around with the spirit of power in love and sound judgment. That we don't have to be afraid that they're going to reject us. We don't have to be afraid that they're not going to like our pie. That we can go with confidence. That we can go in the power of God. Another one of my favorite verses is Joshua chapter 1, 9. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God will not leave us. God will not forsake us. He is going to give us what we need, especially when it's challenging. Now, this last, last obstacle, um, maybe you're here, and maybe this is something that is very real and pressing for you. It's the obstacle of tension or a strained or broken relationship. Now, this is just sort of where this gets real, real, right? And I'm going to guess as I start talking about this, a lot of examples come to mind, maybe even ones that make you mad, all right? So hang with me. But maybe in the past or present, someone did or said something to you or your family or your property. Maybe they did it on purpose or on accident. I had a neighbor, not here in Morgantown, all right? So you can, whew, all right? But it was street parking because we didn't have driveways, and they backed up into my Civic and, and left the impression of their hitch on my bumper. It, it was clearly scratched and pressed in and needed fixed, and they didn't think it was that big of a deal. It was like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. It was. Or, or maybe, maybe you, on accident or on purpose, did something to a neighbor. I mentioned the Kellys last week, and that was a great neighbor, but we had another neighbor that did not go so well because the day they got a brand new garage door, we decided to go play hockey in their driveway. Bad idea. And I'm going to say it wasn't me because I can't remember, maybe it was, but on the day they got that brand new garage door, someone did a slap shot into their garage door and left a dent in their garage door the day they got it. And that damaged our relationship with that neighbor. Kelly's good, not so much this side. These are real things that happen. So what do we do? 
Well, I would say if you've wronged a neighbor, confess it. Seek their forgiveness, seek to make it right, whether it was on purpose or on accident, whatever the case may be. And if they've wronged you, we're called to extend grace and mercy and forgiveness to treat them as we would wish to be treated. Romans chapter 12 is is one of my favorite passages. And I would just say, because we're in close, close proximity, it's not a matter of if something happens with a neighbor, it's probably only a matter of time until it does. It's sort of like family, right? Eventually something's gonna happen. Whether it's on purpose or accident, eventually someone is gonna hurt the other person, so what do you do? Do you sweep it under the rug? Do you pretend like it didn't happen? Do you try to ignore it? Well, we know that doesn't work. So what do we do? I think we, we look at passages like Romans chapter 12. So hear this scripture in the context of maybe a strained relationship that you have right now with that neighbor who's across the hall or across the street or across the way that something has happened And there is strain and you're not sure what to do. It says this, love must be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. And here's the, here is the, the verse that we've got to grab a hold of, if possible, on your part. Because you can't control their response, you can't control them. If possible, on your part, on my part, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. And I recognize that some of you have been or are or will be in some really difficult situations I just want to encourage you, don't write them off, don't retaliate, don't make the problem worse. Seek to live at peace. Humble yourself, own it. Go and seek forgiveness or give that forgiveness. I mentioned in a message maybe five, six months ago, I can't remember, that there was a, a, there was a neighbor who we just kind of ha- had an issue and very uncharacteristically of me, I yelled at a neighbor. I raised my voice. And it was, it was not good and it wasn't right. And I had to cool off and they had to cool off. But, but we went to one another and we owned it. And with, a, with tears in my eyes, I said, that's not like me. I'm so sorry. I raised my voice. Will you forgive me? And he did and vice versa. And our relationship was strengthened. Is that easy? No. But we have God's spirit not a spirit of fear. He has given us his power to go to that person to make it right or to extend that forgiveness. It is possible. And it might not seem that way with your situation or one that you'll face, but I believe with God all things, it is. So which obstacle is it for you? Is it time? Are you just too busy? I think we need to really reflect on what needs to go so that we can have more hours and more evenings and more weekends available. There was a a period of the spring of 2020 where this big thing happened to all of us. You remember that thing? And a lot of the extras just sort of dropped away. A lot of the running and a lot of the extra commitments. And there was a period where people had what? Time. But life moves on and things speed up and here we are again, busy. So maybe you need to just really reflect on your time. Do you have too many or too few? Who will you focus on? Remember, the art of neighboring isn't about the big, it's about the small, it's about loving the person who is nearest to you. Did you try? Did you already try and you've written them off? Are you willing to try Again, and trust that God's at work and remember that we don't know what's going on on the other side of that door. 
Are you timid? What are you unsure of? What step do you need to take in faith, in God's power and in God's strength? And is there tension? Do you need to seek forgiveness or extend forgiveness to that neighbor? So whether it's one of these obstacles or another one that I haven't mentioned today, I just want to encourage us to ask God to help you overcome whatever it is. To ask God to help you overcome and to not make an excuse and to not convince yourself that you can't do it. Because if he's commanded us to do it, whether it's easy or hard, we can be confident that he is willing and able to help us love our neighbors well. And as we overcome these obstacles, we're all going to be able to take steps forward to love our neighbors. And maybe today you're like, Josh, I hear you and I see the scripture, but I don't know where to start. So maybe for you today, you just need to get started by spending some time outside or take a walk. Just being friendly, smiling, waving, and saying hello. Just maintaining your property makes you a good neighbor or looking out for their property. Maybe like bring back neighborhood crime watch, all right? That's the only reason you get to walk around at night in all black with a flashlight, all right? Or maybe just abiding by your community rules if they're applicable. You know, it's, it's these simple things that actually don't even require a lot of interaction with other people that can still cause us to be a great neighbor. From there, we can take steps to, to know and serve our neighbors. We can learn, remember, and greet neighbors by name. We want to keep emphasizing that because when you know a person's name, they move from being a stranger to a real person. We can welcome new neighbors, assist with their move-in, cookies or pies, and you don't even have to make it. I'm known in our neighborhood as the Walmart pie guy, all right? You can buy a pie and drop it off, share your phone number, connect on social media, participate in neighborhood functions, social media groups, just share what you have, whether that be veggies, eggs, your pool, tools, skills, and take initiative to meet needs. If you look around you, there will be needs. Just take initiative. If you've ever raked someone's leaves or cut their grass or shoveled their snow or dropped off a meal without asking permission, I promise you they won't be upset. If you just take initiative to meet a need and to extend that love, they won't be mad at you. They will welcome it and receive it, especially if you know there's a vulnerable family in your area a single parent or an elderly individual without family around meet those needs. And from there, we can deepen our relationship by spending more time and having more close, close interactions with people and really showing them love. Some ways to do that is to invite a neighbor over for dessert or coffee. Just have them over. You're already going to be eating, so include someone else. And I'm telling you, in our neighborhood, the people that we have had over into our home and invite them into our space. That relationship changes forever. It just does. And when you step foot into another person's home and see where they live and see the pictures on their walls, the relationship just changes. You can host at an easy neighborhood gathering, s'mores, water fun, whatever it is, a potluck. Check in via phone or text during the cold months. Celebrate the good. When there's a baby or a promotion or whatever, celebrate that and show up in the hard when they lose a loved one or when they're sick. Ask your neighbors for help when they need it and pray for them and be sensitive to their faith journey. Be sensitive to where they are with God because Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when we do that, we're going to have the opportunity to show them the love of Christ. But we've got to trust that God is at work in their life. God is at work in ways that we cannot see. So we do want to pray for them. And we do want to share the thing that is most important to us and the thing that has changed our life, and that is Jesus Christ. But we don't want to jam it. We don't want to force it. But when that opportunity arises, or maybe when they are having a hard day and you're listening and you say, you know what? I'm sorry you're going through that. Could I pray for you? You know what? We have this thing going on at the church. I, I, you know, would you want to come and be a part of that? You know, as we overcome these obstacles, 
whether they're legitimate or they're excuses, we will have so many tangible opportunities to love and to serve people right where they are. And I think sometimes we get it in our head that if we want to make this great difference for God because we do feel his love in our heart and we, we do want to make a difference and we do see the need around us. So do I start a nonprofit or, or maybe God wants me to go on a mission trip across the country or maybe he wants me to go down state? Maybe, maybe God is just looking for people who he can send across the street. Maybe God is just looking for people who are willing to make a little bit of time, a little bit of margin, extend some forgiveness to that neighbor and just go. And imagine, church, imagine if our collective prayer was, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me across the hall to the person that doesn't seem interested. Here I am, Lord, send me across the street to the neighbor who seems like they have it together, but I'm just concerned for them. Here I am, Lord. Send me in my, tra my truck with my plow up the road to clear someone's driveway. Send me, Lord, send me. I'm telling you, if this was our collective heart and our collective prayer, that we were ready to be sent right where we are, the difference it could make. God, we come to you today and ask you for your help with these things. God, we recognize that there are people all around us who need help. We want to be ones, oh God, who we can be sent, believing that we can go in your power and your strength to make a difference for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'll be glad I chose to say Here I am, Lord, send me Well done, good and faithful I live to hear you sing Here I am, Lord, send me Here I am, Lord, send me I was at uh, Lowe's this week picking something up and I ran into a couple from our church and they said, man, last, last week, last Sunday really meant a lot because we've had to rely on our neighbors. And I don't know if it's a, a knee issue or a back issue, but they, they've been having a hard time keeping up their property and there was a big storm a few weeks ago and they said they just went to bed just so kind of anxious knowing there was going to be limbs down and clean up and just, you know, hurting right now, not being able to do it. And the next day they woke up and they saw their neighbors out picking up those sticks. And here's what I've come to, to realize about neighboring. It's not complicated. It really is as simple as seeing that your neighbor has some sticks down and knowing that their knees been out or their backs been out and just taking a little bit of time to do that. All of us can do it. And God has placed us where he wants us for a reason, whether it's for a season or forever. Will we do it? This really is Christianity 101. It's not complicated, but we will face challenges, but God will help us overcome. So thank you for joining us today. We're so thankful that you're a part of the Ridge in, in various ways, whether it's worshiping with us or, or being out in the community, also through giving. So if you'd like to give and invest today, if you're in person, there's giving boxes or you can see the ways to give online. But just thank you for joining us. Take this this week. Will you take this this week where God has placed you and begin to know and to serve and to love your neighbors. They need us, and we need them as well. God bless. Thanks so much for being with us today. Remember, if this is your first time with us or you recently started joining us, head to Next Steps in the lobby if you're in the room or go to the ridge.church slash new and let us know about you and your experience today. Hey, those middle school and high schoolers, right now in the gym, we have dodgeball and donuts. So head to the gym right now. You get to throw dodgeballs, eat donuts, hang out with our group leaders. You don't want to miss it. Head to the gym now. We'll I see. Think you should go and grab one and then you yes. get a good target. Well, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys next time. All right, see ya. That was mean.